Hello friends, I am Dr. Anupama Chaudhary Devkan and I will be discussing the physiology questions in the recently held NEET PG 2022. Now a very interesting bag of questions in this year's NEET exam, so let's have a look at these. Now uh, the first one is which of the following is true regarding the following diagram and this is a cystometrogram. Now this is basically showing you the intravesicle or the bladder volume on the x-axis and the change in the intravesicle pressure on the y-axis. And as you can see this, initially as the bladder begins to fill up, and that is the segment 1A of this graph, in segment 1A of the graph, as the intravesical volume increases, there is increase in the intravesical pressure. Now let's see what happens in segment 1B. Now here there is an increase in the intravesical volume. The bladder volume increases, but there is no significant increase in the pressure. And then in segment of the systematogram, we find that there is a sharp increase in pressure. Uh, this is, uh, let's try and understand what is the explanation for these different segments. So initially, as the bladder fills up with urine, there is an increase in the intravesical pressure, but then the bladder begins to distend. And as the bladder distends, as there is an increase in radius, there is going to be no significant increase in pressure. And that is segment 1B. And this is explained by what is known as the Laplace's law. Now, what is the Laplace's law? Now, Laplace's law is something which we do in great amount of detail in, uh, uh, in our physiology class. And Laplace's law states that T is equal to P into R. This is for a cylinder. But in the case of a sphere like the bladder, it is going to be T is equal to P R by 2. And if you take the wall thickness into consideration, then it becomes T is equal to P R by 2 W. Now that means what is P? P will be equal to 2 T upon R. So this is basically trying to explain. So as the bladder distends, now, as the bladder is getting filled with urine, there is going to be increase in T, no doubt about that, increase in the wall tension. But simultaneously, what has happened to the radius, this also increases. There is an increase in the numerator and an increase in denominator, so no significant increase in the distending pressure. This is your Laplace's law. And 1B, segment 1B is going to be a manifestation of the Laplace's law. Now, um, what is this dash line? This dash line, which you see over here towards the end, this is basically going to show you that what would have happened to the intravesical pressure with increase in intravesical volume had picturation not happened. In phase two, there is a sharp rise in pressure. There's a sharp rise in the pressure, which causes picturation. So this is uh, the systometrogram. Now, the first urge to pass urine, the first urge to pass urine will be at a bladder volume of 150 ml. It becomes uncontrollable at a bladder volume of 400 ml. Uncontrollable at 400 ml. So these are two important values that you must keep in mind. Let's look at the next question. It says a 35-year-old patient presents with paresis and numbness after sleeping overnight with the arm under his head. Saturday night palsy. This is obviously Saturday night palsy that we're looking at. It is due to increased susceptibility of which of the following nerve fibers to pressure. Now, which nerve fibers are maximally susceptible to pressure? That is type A. And out of type A, it is the A alpha. And A alpha are your motor neurons. These are the most susceptible to pressure compared to the other fibers type B or type C. Right? So A alpha is most susceptible to pressure. When you talk in terms of susceptibility, pressure, the susceptibility to pressure is A more than B more than C. Out of A, it is going to be the A alpha fiber. When you look at susceptibility to hypoxia, this is B more than A more than C. When you look at local anesthetics, the susceptibility to local anesthetics. Now, this is a little controversial, even though Genon says, still continues to say that C fibers are most susceptible to pressure. But if you look up recent research articles, they have very clearly mentioned that it is the A gamma fibers which are most susceptible to local anesthetics. 
A more than B more than C, and out of A, it is going to be the A gamma fibers. Basically, what does this mean? That A is A gamma fibers are most susceptible to local anesthetics as compared to C fibers. This just means that to block the transmission in type C fibers, which are the pain fibers, you need a slightly higher concentration of the drug. That is all that it means. Experimentally, that they found in recent research articles is that A fibers are most susceptible to local anesthetics as compared to B and C. And out of A, A gamma, but to pressure, A alpha. And that is the basis of the Saturday night balance. Let's look at the next next question. It says, following diagram shows changes in hypothalamic set point and body temperature. What changes will be seen at A as compared to B? Now, this is again something which we do in class. This is basically uh, how fever, how fever happens. Now, we know that the uh, our normal body temperature is here, 37 degrees Celsius. This is, of course, given in degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when there is any sort of infection or, uh, or let's say macrophages, they release interleukins, especially interleukin 1. These are your pyrogens. They cause an increase in the hypothalamic set point. Let's say in this case, the hypothalamic set point has gone up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit. Body temperature is lower as compared to the hypothalamic set point. So this is, this is going to be detected by our uh, heat, which is a heat gain center, posterior hypothalamus. Posterior hypothalamus now is going to initiate mechanisms to gain heat. And which are the mechanisms which are going to be initiated to gain heat? And that will occur at A. And the mechanisms which, which will occur at A are number one, a peripheral vasoconstriction. A peripheral vasoconstriction will minimize the heat loss due to uh, radiation conduction convection, mainly radiation. So peripheral vasoconstriction number one, then you have the non-shivering thermogenesis, which is because which is of the because of the action of sympathetic nerve fibers on beta three receptors in brown fat. There is going to be an uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation which generates heat. But this is not an important mechanism of heat production in adults. The most important mechanism which is going to which is responsible for heat gain is shivering, at least in adults. Though in neonates, shivering is not well developed. In neonates, non-shivering thermogenesis is the most important mechanism for heat gain. So at A, heat gain mechanisms will be activated by the posterior hypothalamus so that the body temperature can rise and increase and go up to the new or the elevated hypothalamic set point. And that's what you see at E. Now, let's say you've taken a paracetamol or, there, or during the natural course of the fever, the hypothalamic set point is now lowered. Yes. Now, your body temperature is at 103, but the hypothalamic set point has come down to 98.4 right? Or 98 degrees Celsius. Now, the uh, degrees Fahrenheit, sorry. The, now the um, uh, hypo, now the heat loss center will be activated and mechanisms to lose heat will be initiated so that the body temperature comes back to the new, uh, to the hypothalamic set point, which has come back to normal. So at B, we see heat loss mechanisms which will be activated and which is the heat loss center, our AC, anterior hypothalamus, including preoptic nucleus, which are the mechanisms which will be initiated over here. There is a vasodilation and there is sweating. So the question says, what changes will be seen at A as compared to B? Sweating, no, B, sweating will occur in B. Fall in the body. Increased blood flow over the skin, again in B. What is going to be important in A will be shivering. Right, let's go on to the next question. Now, this is again something which is very well covered in class. What is the baroreceptor reflex? It is definitely a negative feedback mechanism. Negative feedback mechanism. It's always a negative feedback mechanism. 
For example, the normal mean arterial pressure we know is 100 millimeters of mercury. Supposing there is an increase in the mean arterial pressure, let's say it has become 110 millimeters of mercury. This will stimulate the baroreceptors. It increases the firing rate of the baroreceptors. And what is the baroreceptor reflex going to do? The baroreceptor reflex will decrease the sympathetic discharge and this cause a vasodilation and that will lower the blood pressure. Lower the blood pressure. So basically, what is a characteristic feature of a negative feedback mechanism? Reversal of the initiating stimulus. What is the initiating stimulus here? Increase in blood pressure. Baroreceptor reflex causes a decrease in sympathetic discharge and reverses this initiating stimulus, lowers the blood pressure. Right? And similarly, uh, let's say if, the, if there is a fall in the mean arterial pressure, let's say there's been blood loss and the mean arterial pressure has now become 90 millimeters of mercury. Now the baroreceptor reflex will increase the sympathetic discharge. When it increases the sympathetic discharge, a peripheral vasoconstriction, and this will now elevate this blood pressure to bring it back to normal. This is again, here again there is a reversal of the initiating stimulus. Initiating stimulus was fallen blood pressure. This has got reversed. So bad receptor reflex is an example of negative feedback mechanism. Right? Now, what is feed forward? Feed forward and adaptive control. They mean the same thing. Feed forward is anticipatory control. Feed forward or adaptive or anticipated in control. That means the change is initiated before uh, the, the, ref the corrective mechanism has been initiated, even before the change has occurred. That is your feed forward or adaptive. Baroreceptor reflex is always a negative feedback mechanism. And the characteristic of negative feedback reversal of the initiating stimulus. Let's look at the next one. It says, which type of signaling is shown in the following figure? Now, here you have a signaling cell which, which releases its signaling molecules which act on a target cell which is right next to it. And this is going to be paracrine. What is autocrine? Autocrine is when the receptor is present on, this, on, the, uh, on the signaling cell itself. That is autocrine. What is endocrine? When the signaling molecule or hormone enters into the bloodstream and acts on a target cell which is at a distance away from the signaling cell. That is endocrine. What is merocrine? Merocrine refers to the secretion of exocrine glands. Merocrine is when the exocrine secretion, when there is an exocytosis of a secretory vesicle, the secretion comes out of the cell and it enters into an epithelial lined duct or it comes on the surface of the body. That is merocrine. Let's look at the next one. Which of the following will cause a decrease in ECF potassium? Now, um, when you look at this, acidosis, acidosis is a condition which is going to be lactic acid or acidosis is going to be a condition which is associated with increase in H, increase in K+. Plus. This is because in acidosis, especially conditions causing metabolic acidosis, H plus enters into the cell and K plus moves out of the cell. So there is going to be an increase in ECF potassium. Epinephrine, epinephrine and beta-2 adrenergic agonists, they cause an increase in the sodium potassium ATPase activity and they, this will cause a increase in the sodium potassium ATPase pump activity which in turn will cause the potassium to move into the cell and decrease in the ECF potassium. Glucagon. Glucagon will increase the ECF potassium. Atropine has no direct effect on the potassium levels. So out of this, the uh, best answer is going to be epinephrine. Epinephrine will decrease the ECF potassium. Other hormones which can affect the sodium potassium ATPase pump activity. Thyroid. Thyroid will increase it. Insulin. Growth hormone, epinephrine, 
aldosterone. These will cause an increase in pump activity to decrease the ECF potassium. Let's let's just let me just write this down so that it becomes a little clearer. Thyroid, aldosterone, epinephrine will insulin these will increase the sodium potassium ATPase activity causing a even growth hormone will cause a decrease in the ECF potassium on the other hand dopamine and atrial natriuretic peptide they decrease the sodium potassium ATPase activity. So this is this is this is uh, as far as the sodium potassium pump is concerned. Hemibalismus. Hemibalismus is due to a lesion of which of the following nuclei of the basal ganglia. Again, basal ganglia is something which we cover extensively in class. Now, corded nucleus, a lesion of the corded nucleus is will produce chorea. Remember, I keep telling you C for corded nucleus, C for chorea. A lesion of the globus pallidus produces atherosis. Loss of dopaminergic neurons of substantial nigra pars compactor is responsible for Parkinson's. A lesion of the subthalamic nucleus produces hemibalismus. Subthalamic nucleus is the only part of the basal ganglia which secretes glutamate. So the answer to this question is the subthalamic nucleus of Lewis. So these are the physiology questions in the NEAT PG 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much.